is a researcher. Uh, he's the uh, research, uh, a leader of a research group in the uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, in Heidelberg and and he will uh, teach us uh, how to improve the um, initial or the um, the yeah the original uh, features of uh, light field uh, microscopy in order to achieve the the higher standards. So please, Robert, uh, when you want. Uh, sorry, I think that you are mute. Okay, now I found Okay, it. perfect, perfect. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. So I hope you can hear me and see my screen now. Can you confirm? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. And you can see the screen very well. Yeah, and the screen as well. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, thanks for this. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and actually for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to present at your meeting. Um, obviously, I would have loved to come um, to Spain in person and actually um, see the nice city and meet you all in person. So hopefully, we'll get a chance um, in the future to do that. So um, as as was already said, I'm a group leader at the EMBL in Heidelberg, where my lab actually focuses on the development of various microscopy technologies in very close collaboration with biologists. And so today it's really a pleasure for me to present our recent work on light field microscopy, which is of course a very elegant method uh, I find for fast three-dimensional microscopy. And that's also perfectly suited to um, visualize um, fast three-dimensional uh, dynamics. And so before I want to dive into more details, I'd like to highlight the omnipresent and you know, always recurring challenge that exists in biology, where the researchers always want to capture and visualize both subcellular as well as tissue-wide dynamics with sufficient spatial temporal resolution. And this is because of, course of the multiple different uh, timescales that are involved here, reaching from the micron level up to the millimeter level, but also because of the involved time scales, which can re reach from milliseconds up to hours. And of course, this is a big challenge for us in microscopy to deal with this. And typically when, uh, when we want to image a large three-dimensional um, organism, such as here the Drosophila larvae, uh, many people resort to standard techniques, such as for example, uh, confocal or two-photon microscopy, which is a sequential imaging technique, as we all know, where a single diffraction limit point is scanned across the uh, single plane, point by point, and then plane by plane to reconstruct the entire three-dimensional volume. And this is, of course, fairly slow. And on top of that, we typically always are faced with the inherent trade-offs between speed, resolution, and field of view. So it's really kind of clear that conceptually we have to invent new approaches that go beyond the sequential imaging um, acquisition in order to really be able to bridge this vast um, spatial and temporal scales in biology. So besides the speed issue, of course, there's also an additional concern when we try to image live biological samples, which is very obvious in confocal microscopy. So if you here again take the Drosophila larvae and we excite individual points with a confocal microscope, point by point, plane by plane, then we quickly see that we're exposing the entire organism to a lot more phototoxic light than we would need to because we're only recording from this red area here, the focal plane. So of course, as we all know, the problems of slow speed and also phototoxicity were solved with the introduction of the now widely known light microscope, where here now we illuminate from an orthogonal direction from the side, and we really only illuminate and excite the focal plane from which we also are collecting um, the signal. And so the fact that by this we're reducing the phototoxicity, but also increasing the speed because we can record with an area detector, such as a camera, has led, of course, to vast improvements in bioimaging, where now it's possible to image an entire embryo in a fraction of a second and reducing the phototoxicity by an order of magnitude, at least. And this has enabled really beautiful experiments in the past, and I would just 
was want to just highlight two of those here where um, the group of uh, Misha Arens and uh, Philip Keller have for the first time shown that you can really image the entire zebrafish larvae brain activity. Or here on the right, this is beautiful experiments from the Huisken lab where a light sheet microscopy was used to um, image the beating heart of a zebrafish. So light microscopy is great, but there's still some challenges because here in the, if we want to image, for example, the entire zebrafish brain, this can only be done with sort of on the fraction of a second, maybe one, two hertz, but not much more. And similarly, while here we see a nice movie of a, a beating zebrafish heart, actually this beating was not really um, imaged in real time, but actually reconstructed from individual planes that were sampled in post-processing. So light sheet microscopy is great, but obviously it's still not fast enough for some very um, dynamic biological um, processes. And this is exactly where light field microscopy can provide some fundamental advantage. And so we've already heard a nice introduction to light field microscopy from Manuel in the very first talk of the session. So I won't go into much technical detail, but let me briefly maybe recapitulate for those who have just joined this session. So in light field microscopy, we rely on measuring both the lateral as well as angular information of the light that is emitted by the sample. And this can be uh, achieved by introducing a micro lens array into the imaging path of a conventional, for example, here, epifluorescence microscope. And this micro lens array now gives really access to both the angular and depth information of the sample, where roughly speaking, the number of micro lenses now translates to the lateral resolution and the number of pixels uh, behind one micro lens uh, basically uh, define the axial resolution. So light field microscopy is really elegant and powerful for fast volumetric imaging because now this gives us access to really instantaneously capture three-dimensional volumes on a two-dimensional um, array, like a camera uh, plane. And because there's absolutely no scanning or mechanically moving parts, the camera rate um, of the microscope is also the volume rate with which we can image. And this is very powerful. And of course, on top of this, it's fairly easy and simple to implement because we only need to introduce a micro lens array into the imaging path. However, the fact that we now record four dimensional light fields on a two dimensional camera array also comes with trade offs between the lateral and axial resolution. And uh, although this concept of light field microscopy was, as, as Manuel already mentioned, introduced in the uh, early 2000s by Levoy and others, it has actually not been used for a lot of practical bioimaging for a long time. And I feel this has changed in 2013 when uh, uh, the Stanford group uh, of Mark Levoy realized that actually the, the light field microscope also performs an axial coding of the coin spread function, as you can see here in this drawing, where if we have an emitter residing at the exact focal plane of our microscope, then the light will be, you know, basically fill an entire micro lens. However, if we move away from the native focal plane in uh, the axial dimension, then this leads to a very particular pattern on the camera sensor. And if we sort of model this uh, optical system, we can sort of, we can predict um, also the, the light distribution on the sensor and knowing uh, this mapping, we can invert this model and thereby go from a light field image back to a three-dimensional volume, and we call this basically light field deconvolution. And the fact why this really changed a little bit the way we did light field microscopy was that it also allowed us or allowed anyone to reconstruct and deconvolve volumes at a higher resolution. And why this is possible uh, can be seen in this plot here where the Stanford group has simulated the light field rays as they propagate through um, uh, the volume. And as, as you can see here, off the, the native focal plane or off the um, micro lens array position, there's a dense sampling of this space by the, by the light rays. And this really actually permits 3D deconvolution with improved resolution that is better than just the lens that's spacing that you would have in standard light field microscopy. So back then, we, we built the light field microscope based on these principles. We wrote our own deconvolution um, uh, software, and we applied it to whole uh, animal imaging or bit calcium imaging um, of C. elegans larvae. And here for the first time, what we could really show is that we were able to image 
the neuronal activity of not only the head ganglia or the brain of the worm, but really the entire uh, body um, of, of, of this um, uh, nematode. And furthermore, we couldn't only do this just in one field of view, but we could also do it at fairly high frame rates, which then actually also meant very high volume rates. And um, this was really the first demonstration of, of calcium imaging of an entire uh, animal. And of course, we then went in and we could also analyze the calcium activity of all these individual neurons. And we could show that we can, um, that we can basically identify more than 100 neurons in a typical recording and then plot the calcium activity and therefore the neuronal activity of all these neurons over time. But maybe even more uh, exciting for us, we now we're also able to image the zebrafish larvae brain, as was, has been done previously with light sheet microscopy, but now at a much higher volume rate. Instead of maybe one hertz, two hertz, we were easily able to do it at 20 hertz because now, of course, we, we, our, our microscope did not include any scanning elements. And really, the frame rate of our camera um, was basically the volume rate at which we were able to image. And although the re optical resolution in this type of microscopes is still poorer than in a light sheet or confocal, still by applying principal and independent and component analysis approaches, we were able to um, identify and segment individual neurons and plot their respective calcium traces. And as you can see here on the right, for example, um, upon the onset of auto stimulation, we were really able to distinguish many neurons that were slightly shifted in time and we could plot their activity. And again, this was sort of the first demonstration of really fast three-dimensional um, calcium imaging, in this case, um, for the for the zebrafish larvae brain of a fairly large field of view of more than 700 microns in the lateral domain. And this, I feel, has started really a sort of a new field in biology where now lots of people have started to apply light field microscopy to their problems. Um, we worked on saligans and zebrafish, but others in the meantime have also applied this to Drosophila or even the more scattering mouse cortex. And I'm only sort of highlighting here a couple papers from the past years, but also, you know, just in the last few years, there's been um, really a multitude of new works coming out that's not possible to actually all cite this on a single page. So this is really all great. Um, and I feel we have established life with microscopy is a very powerful tool, but still there are always this sort of hidden drawbacks that people don't like to mention a lot and this uh, sort of try to brush them under the rug. And so when I uh, moved to EMBL, um, a couple of years ago, I wanted to sort of work on, on those uh, remaining drawbacks in light field microscopy. And so one of those drawbacks is that the optical resolution, although it was already significantly improved, is also still fairly poor um, in, when compared to, for example, light sheet microscopy, especially along the set direction. And furthermore, I've, I've highlighted the fact that, you know, around the zero position, um, the micro lens arrays, there's no dense sampling of the image space. And therefore there's also this so-called artifact plane where the resolution is still fairly poor and cannot be improved by the standard deconvolution. And last but not least, since light field microscopy is in, our, in the way we do it, a computational reconstruction um, technique, it's also sensitive to out of volume light. So for example, if we excite fluorophores that are outside our volumes of interest, then this will, of course, bleed into our volumes and confuse the reconstruction algorithm. And this can be nicely seen by uh, a paper from the Fraser Group that came out uh, earlier this year where there was a market improvement by um, applying a selective plane illumination um, with the light field microscopy. So back in the days, um, I joined then forces with a, a very renowned light sheet microscopy lab at the EMBL with Lars Hufnagel. And we set out to address these shortcomings. And we did this by combining two techniques, namely light field and light sheet microscopy, where we introduced a selective plane illumination scheme to get rid of out of volume fluorescence. But also at the same time, we uh, adapted a so-called dual view detection geometry, which allowed us to really uh, achieve isotropic and higher resolution imaging and to reduce the artifacts. And why this is possible can be seen by this animation where 
if you consider that you are imaging this uh, one sample from two views, you are able to sort of reconstruct or fuse the two data sets in post-processing and therefore really uh, obtain an isotropic PSF and therefore also isotropic resolution. And so just to repeat, we back then we termed this um, approach ISO-LFM for isotropic, isotropic light field microscopy. And it's really based on this concept of having three mutually orthogonal ob objectives where we excite the, the sample of interest from one direction and then detect two light fields in an again um, mutually orthogonal configuration. And this, this really this, this, this orthogonal detection here then allows us to perform um, dual view um, deconvolution and post-processing therefore to increase the resolution. So again here, so just by step by step, this is how um, our ISO LFM approach um, works. So we illuminate our sample, we record two independent light fields on two cameras. We reconstruct those light fields. We then rotate one um, of the two volumes to bring it back into the same um, reference system. And then we run um, a dual view data fusion algorithm on it in to obtain uh, images of, of higher resolution. And of course, as you can already see from the simple schematic, uh, this is a highly computational approach. It's really key that the two um, volumes are registered with a very high um, precision to really uh, enable this data fusion at the, at the highest possible quality and therefore also at the best possible resolution. And here on this slide, I'm just showing a few impressions from the lab. This is here a close up of um, the imaging chamber where you can see this objective, the illumination objective, where we come in with the excitation light. And then here, um, two orthogonal objectives for detection. And here in the middle would be the sample. And here on the right, you can see some impressions from the lab um, and here more detailed uh, sample drawing. And as I mentioned, this approach is highly computational. So we uh, wrote our own um, post-processing algorithms and, and computational pipeline, uh, which was largely based on um, our own um, software, but also by incorporating um, typical ImageJ or Fiji plugins that are necessary for registering the two views to deconvolve um, the, the, the two views and bringing the two volumes into the same reference system. And by um, applying this routine, we were basically able to reconstruct on the order of a thousand volumes and therefore also dual view um, process around a thousand volumes within 24 hours. So how well does ISO LFM perform? Here on the left, you can see a comparison between a single objective light field, so the, the typical, let's say, AP fluorescence light field microscope, and here on the right, the same beats image with our dual view or ISO LFM approach. And what you can really see is while there's no real difference in, of course, the lateral um, resolution, the axial resolution gets improved dramatically here by a factor of four, and it, it's really getting to the isotropic regime. Even more importantly, what we were able to achieve by this approach is really to um, avoid the fact that typically the axial resolution um, gets really much worse with increasing imaging depth, which you can see here in this dashed lines. But instead, in our dual view approach, we have an almost constant and isotropic uh, resolution throughout the imaging volume. And as you can also see, there's no artifact plane in our case. So there's no worse resolution at the native um, 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 image plane. And the improvement can be up to eightfold, especially at the edges of um, the imaging volume. Now, of course, showing this on beats is always nice but uh, we want to work with biologists. So we again uh, took one of the most dynamic and challenging samples. And here in this case, we were imaging the beating Medaka heart here at the frame and therefore also volume rate of more than a hundred Hertz. And again, what you can see here on the top is the single view reconstructed light fields here on the bottom, the dual view. And what I hope you can appreciate really in this zoom in regions here is that here we can, in the dual view, can really make out individual um, nuclei of the myocardium, which are completely lost in the normal single view 
um, light field microscopy. And here we were really able to image, as I said, at a frame rate of more than 100 hertz of a fairly large um, imaging volume. And also importantly, this was really the first time that we could image uh, the beating heart of, of the fish in real time and not reconstruct these movies from, from different um, periodic heartbeats. So furthermore, we also imaged um, blood flow through blood vessels. And again, here is the comparison between a single and dual view. And again, what you can hopefully appreciate is that only in a dual view, you can uh, really identify individual red blood cells. And the data now is here good enough that we can actually track individual um, blood cells through these vessels. And we can measure their flow velocity and also how the flow velocity changes over time. And basically what you can see here is the periodic beating of the heart. And last but not least, here's a nice movie that shows how these blood cells are being pumped through the two chambers of the zebrafish heart, uh, Medaka heart. And what you can see here very interestingly is that some of the red blood cells really stay behind in these chambers. They're not pumped through in one go, but actually reside for a number of um, heartbeats. And this was previously un unobserved. So really here, the, our, uh, our imaging method made a real difference in this respect. So again, this is all great. We improved resolution. We pushed the volume rate to even higher levels, but still um, there are always bottlenecks in, in every microscopy approach. And I believe in light field microscopy, in particular in this deconvolution, approach, it's basically the fact that we still have to deal with this iterative and fairly long um, deconvolution, uh, where, for example, in our case, we're using a Richardson-Lucy deconvolution approach. And that, that normally takes more than, let's say, 15 minutes for a single uh, volume to reconstruct. And so if you then have thousands of volumes, you know, you get to many hundreds of hours of reconstruction just for a single video. So if you want to apply this for real biology and for repeated imaging, of course, this is a big problem. And um, with the introduction and rise of, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning microscopy, also with other people in the past have explored the use of so-called neural networks and deep learning um, in order to sort of directly learn um, this mapping from the light field image to the deconvolved uh, volume. And there's been two very nice papers being published early on uh, this year. And uh, in this particular schemes, what, what, what these two papers did was that they basically trained the networks with high resolution images that were obtained on a separate microscope. So for example, here, I think it was C. elegans that they put on a confocal microscope, they trained the networks, and then they did the light field imaging and reconstructed. But this to us raised, of course, a number of questions of how well, of course, these networks generalize and how well they can be transferred. And is there any way of that we can actually check how well these um, networks are doing? So we were also a little bit questionable. So this is why we turned to a collaboration with the lab of Anna Kreschuk at the EMBL, who, who works on computational image analysis, is one of the pioneers also of using machine learning um, in uh, biology and, and image analysis. And uh, together with their student, um, Finn, we were also quickly able to um, come up with a network architecture um, where we basically fed the network with different um, angular views of our light fields. And therefore then from these networks to quickly infer a three-dimensional volume. And similar to the papers that I just mentioned, um, this works really fast. So for example, at the moment, we can now infer a three-dimensional volume at the rate of around 18 Hertz. So it takes us about um, 50 milliseconds instead of 15 minutes. So that's almost a thousand fold improvement compared to deconvolution. But still when we uh, applied those networks, very often we found that we were not completely um, able to trust them. So it, for us it was sort of a black box and it was also not sure how well it generalizes. So brainstorming about how we could actually solve this big problem, we realized that our microscope could be rebuilt into a hybrid microscope where we um, could at the same time image not only the light field, but also here in uh, dark green, um, individual planes um, with a sort of a selective plane illumination microscopy modality. 
And so we rebuilt our microscope to allow that. And so here, what you can see is um, in this microscope, now we illuminate again from the side. We can illuminate either the whole volume and detect it via micro lens array um, on our light field camera, or we can at the same time also illuminate a single plane and then image this with a light sheet camera and then quickly reposition the focal plane in detection. Uh, and also, of course, since we are using galvanometric mirrors, also reposition the excitation plane in this volume. And so really what this now, this hybrid microscope, which in our term high LFM allows us is to give us sort of simultaneous information about the ground truth at the high resolution in 2D. It also allows us to on the fly basically generate training data for our neural networks. And to do this on the same microscope with the same sample, therefore um, overcoming some of the limitations of, of this previous work that I mentioned. But also most importantly now, this spin data that we are acquiring at the same time can also be used for online validation and refinement, which I'll mention in, um, in a few slides. But before that, let me also say that, of course, one of the very nice byproducts of this scheme is that since the neural network, which we now named high LFM net, learns the reconstruction from very high resolution spin data, um, the reconstructions also come out at a higher resolution. As you can see here, where we compare the, on the right, the Richardson Lucy deconvolution to our neural network. And as you can see, see especially in the, again, the Excel dimension, the resolution is much improved. And also again, when we plot this over set, over imaging depth, the resolution is improved and it's also more hom homogeneous and it doesn't vary as much as it typically does. Um, and again, of course, we don't want to just show this on beats. We wanted to again show this on a very challenging system, biological sample. Again, we, we took the zebrafish, uh, sorry, Medaka heart. And here you can see the reconstruction of the, of the neural network of a beating Medaka heart. And here are individual planes where we compare now the reconstruction to the high resolution spin data. And what I want to really um, highlight here is that these reconstructions are actually done on samples that were not included in training, which actually shows the high generalization of our networks. So any of these inferred um, images here, um, the network has never seen in training. And now we can also compute um, so-called image metrics of how well this, um, this reconstructions compare to the high resolution ground truth data. And we can always show that with the high LFM net, we actually we get higher values higher image metrics than with the standard deconvolution. And here's a video that basically just shows how here in Cyan, a single light sheet volume always sweeps through the volume while we are acquiring the data with LFM. And now that really gives us the, um, uh, the capability to also check online in real time how well our reconstructions compare to individual slices. So we can really do online validation of our neural networks. And what you can see here is so over, over several minutes of the recording, um, here the light sheet sweeps through the volume. Of course, we have poorer resolution in some image planes that are further away from the objective, but we can always check over time how well is our reconstruction performing. And of course, at some points, we can also step in and say, okay, now the reconstruction is not good enough. Actually, we want to improve this. And then we can use the spin data to refine uh, our networks. And here you can see, for example, after already 25 refinement iterations, the resolution gets much better. And after, let's say, a thousand refinement iterations, the quality is really, really high. And as you can see also here in this plot, where you can see that with an initial network performance of, let's say, 0.8, we can radically improve this up to around 0.95. Um, but most importantly, what I want to note here is this refinement can sort of, although that happens sort of, of course, offline, we have to retrain the networks. It doesn't mean that any imaging data or experiments have to be stopped or any data is lost. We can basically just acquire the data, post the light field or the, or the light sheet, and then in the reconstruction at some point, we can go in and say, okay, now this quality is not good enough. We want to refine the network. Um, and then a few hours later, we can come back and we can reconstruct the real imaging data at a really high rate at 18 hertz, as I mentioned. And then within a few minutes, look at the refined videos. And last but not least, and this is my last slide, um, we also 
uh, applied this to imaging calcium um, dynamics again in the zebrafish larvae. And, and what we showed here basically is also that quantitatively we can get very accurate reconstructions, as you can see here, is this overlap between the, um, the spin and the high elephant net, which matches um, the, ground the ground truth um, dynamics fairly well. So with this, I want to finish and basically just look back at uh, my presentation. And I hope I could convince you that life with microscopy um, elegantly overcomes some of the limitations of um, more sequential imaging techniques, such as confocal or two photon. The real advantage, of course, in light field is that the camera frame rate is the volume rate. Um, and therefore, it can really be dramatically improved. I also showed you how we can improve and make resolution isotropic through a multi-view approach in light field um, microscopy and how to significantly reduce the artifacts. And last but not least, I showed you how we can approach the bottleneck of the computational reconstruction and how we can use neural networks and machine learning to both improve the speed, but also the quality of our reconstruction and make sure that we really have trustable um, neural network reconstructions. And I hope that with all this, this shows the potential for really um, more widespread use in microscopy and hope this will be taken up by the community in the future. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk and um, basically just want to acknowledge all the wonderful people who contributed to this, um, especially Niels Wagner and Niels Norlin, who has been driving the development of the microscope. And of course, the, the crash lab here in particular, Finn, but also Martin, who's now at EPFL. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. So uh, thank you very much for this Im impressive talk, uh, Robert. I think that um, we have time for, let's say, one question. And uh, after that, remember that um, uh, all of you can, can have a, a, a more direct uh, talk with the with, uh, speaker in uh, starting at 11.05 uh, uh, in, in the uh, mid speaker, uh, sorry, uh, at 11.55 uh, 11, uh, 11 at uh, the mid speaker uh, room uh, with Robert. Uh, I only have time for one question and I will select one from the, the, the ones that are in the, in the chat. The other ones will be kept for the, for the, for the mid speaker session. And um, Lucas Martins asked uh, about, uh, is there a central low resolution spot that still remains from where you don't have enough re spatial resolution from both views when you use uh, the two ones? Uh, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So no, I think that you are mute. Am I? Sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm not muted on my. No. Hello. I can hear you well, Robert. I don't know what is happening now with, with Genaro. Uh, okay, hello. <laughs> so can, can you hear me? So maybe I just try to answer. That. Is there a technician that can help us with the with the microphone? I think uh, Robert. Uh, I think that everyone can hear you. Okay, ah, okay yeah, that's okay. also what I. So go yeah, on, go on, muted. Robert, because I think that it's my problem. Okay, so then maybe there I... are some people saying in the chat that uh, they can hear. Okay, so then maybe so I go, just try to go on, to please. Explain. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a very good question because. In dual view, of course, when you when you image them from from two views, um, of course, you you still have sort of one center line that technically um, there's there are still artifacts. So we can't sort of completely remove the artifacts by this approach, but there's still sort of a, a center line between the merging of the two views where uh, you don't really have access um, to a good uh, view from either of the sides. Uh, this doesn't really show up in the in the volume reconstruction because it's really just a really thi thin, uh, fine line that goes through the volume. But technically, you're correct. There's still a very small region uh, where we don't have um, 
improved resolution. Okay, thank you very much. I think that it is time that uh, we move to the next speaker. So thank you very much again, uh, Robert, for your impressive talk and, and see you in the uh, mid speaker room.